All right. Today we're taking a journey with Sabbath. With Sabbath. This message this morning was born in Sabbath school last week. I was so impressed with last week's Sabbath school panel. I don't know if you saw it. Um, if you didn't, the internet is a thing, and you can still go check it out on the internet, on our YouTube page or our Facebook page, and I would strongly recommend you do that because it was a really good discussion. It inspired me. It troubled me. It gave me all those, those kind of pastorly feelings, and ultimately that's where this came from. I wanted to kind of keep going with that discussion. The whole thing was about the Sabbath, the covenant sign. Um, and so I really wrestled with God throughout this week because what do you do with the Sabbath? Do you go through the standard texts to explain what the Sabbath is? Are we going more in how to keep it properly, which is usually an Ellen White sermon? Um, what do you do? So I, I wrestled. I went back and forth on this issue. And what finally felt right in my heart was to simply testify what does the Sabbath mean to me? Right? And you may remember, you may know that I was not born as a Seventh-day Adventist, so I came to Sabbath from scratch. And as such, uh, if we have an evangelistic mindset, perhaps some of my journey would be helpful to be aware of because I think a lot of those people out there are on some similar journey, right? So... This story begins when I was young, eight, maybe nine. I don't remember exactly. I was raised in a nominally Catholic home, so we'd attend church on Sunday, uh, but that's about it, you know? That, that was about it. We weren't really practicing Christians at home, and I didn't know very much about the scriptures, and what I did know, what I was taught, turns out not to have been very correct, <laughs> as I learned later on in life. But I had this curiosity for God, and I recall one Sunday, f I don't remember why, I don't remember if it was part of the homily or where this idea came from, but it, I got it in my head that Jesus was Jewish, and that we were followers of Jesus, and yet somehow, for some reason, we were not Jewish, and that seemed very... Uh, weird to me. It seemed like a problem that needed an answer. Why am I following this Jew but not adopting the religion that he had? Right? So I asked my mom and she didn't have a good answer. I'm pretty sure I even asked the priest. And I don't recall getting a good answer from him either. And for 20 years, 15, 20 years after that, this question is lingering in my mind. Why, if I am following a Jew, am I not Jewish? And in New York, where I grew up, uh, my joke is every third person there is Jewish. That's a joke, but it's not all that far from the truth, at least in my corner of New York. So I knew a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Jewish people growing up. And as I, as I began to dawn on me that they also went to their religious services once a week, just like I did, but they went on a different day. Well, this just brought up new questions, too. It's like, well, why? Why is Sunday holy for Christians and Saturday is holy for Jews? And then once I learned about the Muslims, why is Friday holy for Muslims? You know, where did all this come from? How many answers do you think I got? Yeah, it's a nice round number. <laughs> Nobody had any answers. And so I'm getting all of these information and questions with no answers, just getting more and more confused. And so the long version made short is that when I went to college, I found New York City to be much more attractive than any church did. And I just kind of quit being a Christian. I quit be being much of anything. Um, the, I'm a writer, so the writings from that time betrayed a curiosity for God and a desire for God, but, you know, that was it. I wasn't actually pursuing it because every pursuit that I had taken up to that point had met in failure. So if none, if none of the godly people have answers, maybe there just are no answers, and I'm going to go to a movie at midnight instead. You know, this is my mentality. So you can imagine 
as Seventh-day Adventist people who I assume are familiar with Daniel chapter 7 and the little horn, you can imagine what happened in my brain when I sat down and learned Daniel 7 for the first time. Suddenly, and I'm 25 maybe, 26, something like that. I'm in my, my mid to upper 20s at this point. But it's like I'm eight years old again, standing in that Catholic church, asking that question, why am I not Jewish if the man I'm following is Jewish? And Daniel 7 showed up, Daniel, God through Daniel showed up and said, actually, Steve, it turns out uh, these ideas you had when you were young are the right ideas. <laughs> there is no scriptural reason why Sunday's a holy day. There is no scriptural real difference between a believing Christian and a believing Jew. And Daniel 7 showed up and said, I know the world has all these differences, but here is why. Here's where all those differences came from. And Daniel 7 said, those differences are not from God. They're from the little horn. They're from, in fact, that same organization that confused you so badly in the first place. <laughs> so everything changed after that. It was like, you know, the light bulb moment in my mind. The light bulb turned on and has yet to turn off. I get excited when I preach Daniel 7. When I do it one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, I usually give two studies in a row or on Daniel 7 because it's just that important. I quickly realized, scripturally speaking, that it wasn't all that hard to figure out what day the Sabbath is. Go to Mark 16. In two verses, you can prove it. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint Jesus, uh, the dead body of Jesus. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen and they find him not to be there. So in these two verses, we discover that on resurrection day, Sabbath was over already. So resurrection day and Sabbath day are not the same. And then resurrection day is the first day of the week, whereas scripture is very, very, very clear that Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And so this sets it up and says, okay, there it is. In two verses, Saturday is the Sabbath. Sunday is not. Hallelujah. It's not very complicated at all. And then I moseyed into uh, the book of Hebrews, eventually. And I read that lengthy, wordy passage by Paul that, we, that Brother Dante read a few minutes ago. And if you kind of boil away all the fluff, what that passage tells us is that Sabbath brings us into the presence of God, right? When we rest according to the commandment, when we rest the way God wants us to, it creates a connection between us and God that cannot be obtained in any other way. So now I'm thinking, well, this is fantastic. I know the right day. It's from the scriptures. I'm not wrong about that. I know how it changed from that day. I know who's responsible for it. I know the theological controversy. Hallelujah. All of that. And I get a connection to God that's unique through the Sabbath. I can't get it any other way. I felt like I had stumbled into the theological lottery. I just, I was on top of the world. So with all of this in mind, I kept my first Sabbath in the woods of Santa Cruz. Hmm. <laughs> Because at that time in my life, I was not in any way interested in joining a church or even attending a church service. I had been so thoroughly burned by the various churches that I tried to attend as a young person that it was nowhere in my consciousness to become part of a church again. In fact, fun fact, the very first thing that I said to the pastor who baptized me on the night before he baptized me was, I don't want to join your church. <laughs> so this is the mentality that I had at the time. I was very interested in Jesus and I was not in any way interested in the church. So I took my knowledge of Sabbath and I went into the woods on Saturday morning and I spent time in nature with God and it was amazing. It was amazing. I went back the next week. <laughs> I went back and I went back and I went back because I found my God 
in nature on his holy day. Eventually, I would bring Marina with me. The two of us would commune with God. It was fantastic. I was hooked. I was hooked. It was not only correct, it not only helped me understand history, it not only promised a connection to God, but it actually delivered that connection. Here I am getting closer to my girlfriend, who's now my wife, because of this, even as she's resisting all the other, you know, Bible studies and everything else that's going on. Even as she doesn't want to learn anything specific, she's enjoying the Sabbath. Sabbath is so powerful. It's so good. So I'm hooked. I am a Sabbath keeper because I love Jesus. <laughs> now I had a problem. So with the gospel, we often have the problem where we get something in our brains and it feels good. But then for whatever reason, we get kind of like mental constipation and it does not transfer that, that 18 inches down to our hearts. So it just kind of lives in our brains forever and never becomes part of who we are in our heart. So practically speaking, I own a business at this time. I'm selling insurance. I'm self-employed. And for those of you who have ever been or currently are self-employed, you know the maxim of self-employment is you don't work, you don't get paid. Okay? There's no such thing as taking a day off and getting paid anyway when you're self-employed. So as I was very poor, had a ton of debt, and was more or less supporting this girl, who's now my wife, but she was in college, so I'm, 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 I'm bearing the brunt of that. Um, I'm also working seven days a week. Because you don't work, you don't get paid. So I'm working seven days a week, including Sabbath. And that was the first conflict for me. After those first few days in the woods that hooked me on the concept, I realized I had bills to pay. <laughs> and so I went right back to, you know, going to open houses and you know, all the stuff I would do on a Saturday to try to generate business. And suddenly it wasn't so attractive anymore. So I had a mentor at the time, the guy who taught me the Bible in the first place also happened to be my boss at work or the closest thing I had to a boss at work so I shared this what I'm sharing with, with you now I shared it with him and he pointed me to Exodus chapter 20 oh the Hebrews were right it remains therefore a rest for the people of God but Exodus 20 it's part of the fourth commandment it says very plainly six days you shall labor and do all of your work but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God in it you shall do how much work? No work. And so that's now, that's my, this is, this is the nature of the conflict. God says don't do any work. And I say, but I'm working seven days a week and I still don't earn enough money. <laughs> how in the world do you expect me to take a day off under these circumstances? But, I was committed to Sabbath already. So it didn't take a lot of convincing for me to take Saturday off. It took a little bit because I was pretty convinced I was going to go hungry. But someone convinced me, how about you just don't do that this week? <laughs> just, you know, the plans you have, you want to go to this, these four open houses and all this stuff. Like, just don't, don't do that. Just don't. See what happens following week I made a whole bunch of sales <laughs> took a day off and I, I, I earned more money the following week so now I'm, I'm I said okay Lord got it I understand the truth of the Sabbath I'm kind of keeping Sabbath I'm not going to work anymore I'm a Sabbath keeper ah hallelujah now I'm starting to go to church took me a while to really start liking it but I started to go I'm a Sabbath keeper that's what Sabbath keepers do now here's the next conflict I ran into and kind of the main point of this whole thing Sabbath what does Sabbath point to 
creation. Was that, was that you who said that? Yeah, that's correct. Sabbath exists because creation exists. Sabbath is a memorial in time to what God did 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, what, whatever your timeline is for the beginning of the world. The Bible's timeline is 6,000 years ago. Whatever you particularly believe, in the beginning, God created. Without that creation, there is no Sabbath. So if I'm a Sabbath keeper, and I'm convinced of the truth of it, and I'm convinced of the power of it, and I'm not going to be giving it up, but I don't actually believe in the thing that it points to, that's a problem, isn't it? And I didn't believe in creation. I was a product of public school in seventh grade science class. My teacher, whose name I could tell you, but I won't just in case, right? I don't want to slander the poor woman. But she, she was very plain in telling us that any and all creation stories uh, were totally nonsense, that macroevolution, Darwinian evolution was now a proven fact, and we were all so much smarter now than we ever used to be. And if you decided to choose anyway to believe Genesis 1, then you were just displaying your ignorance. This is what I was taught in the seventh grade. So, as a good teenager who wants to fit in, I decided that I would take my teacher's advice and denigrate and look down upon anybody who did, in fact, choose to believe what the Bible said. And I decided I was not going to believe that. So I didn't believe it. And you can imagine the conflict this, this brought to me. How can I be a Sabbath keeper but not believe in creation? I hope that there is, well, I hope actually there's no one in this room with that struggle right now because I hope we're all kind of sanctified believers and we're beyond that struggle. But if there is anybody in the room where you are a Sabbath keeper but not a creationist, right? I'm appealing to you right now. These things go together. They cannot be separated one from another. Without creation, there's no reason to keep Sabbath at all. And I realized that I was going to have to go in one way or another. I'd have to reconcile these things. I was going to have to give up on the Sabbath entirely because I didn't believe in the reason it existed in the first place. Or I was going to have to figure out this creation thing. And so I began, a, I began that journey. I read books. I watched presentations and documentaries and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I've read, I, I went through geology. I went through history. I read Patriarchs and Prophets, which was powerful. Really was. Just as much as anything else I read, Patriarchs and Prophets uh, was a powerful tool in that. But it took, I would say, probably two years for me to firmly get it. And I remember, I remember when I, when I kind of no longer had any doubt, I had seen enough and learned enough that it was real in my head. I was so excited about it, I called up a friend of mine <laughs> um, who's now a pastor as well in our conference, but wasn't at the time. I just called him up and I said, you, won't, you I'm so happy, I just gotta tell you, I've been studying and I've decided to believe in creation. <laughs> All of this was because of the Sabbath. If I was trying to become a Sunday keeping Christian at the time, I would have never wrestled with this because Sunday doesn't point to the Sabbath. If anything, Sunday points to the resurrection of Jesus, right? That's what most of them say. We go to church on Sunday because it points to the resurrection. Creation is nothing. It's not there at all. So keeping Sunday would not have led me on this journey towards creation keeping Sabbath did. Have you ever considered the power of the Sabbath in that way? The Sabbath equalizes all of us. And we've been living in a society for 12 months or so now that has tried to go out of its way to make sure that we are not united at all. We're going to be divided according to educational lines and economic lines and racial lines and, you know, et cetera, right? N nationality lines and, and ethnicity lines and citizenship lines. We're going to subdivide all of you into the tiniest little groups possible and make sure that you know how different you are than the other guy. 
Then Sabbath shows up and says, no, you're not. You're all sons and daughters of Adam. Right? Not only are you all equal in the sight of God, but you don't have the right to divide yourselves the way the world does. You cannot call yourself a creation-believing, Sabbath-keeping Christian and then buy into all of this nonsense. It doesn't work that way. We are united in Christ because we are all sons of Noah, sons of Adam, right? Only Sabbath gives us that insight. Only Sabbath. So, I tried to allude to this in Sabbath school this morning, but when we are connected to the God of creation, the Lord of the Sabbath, the same as the God of creation, that means we have creation power at our disposal. It doesn't mean that I can create a world because I say so, right? But it does mean that I am connected to the God who can create a world just because he says so. And scripture says that same power that raised Jesus lives in me, right? There is creation power in the Sabbath. I mean, in relating to Jesus, but through the Sabbath connection, we have access to power that we don't have access to in a different way. And I could tell you stories. I, I, I won't. Some of them are mine and some of them are other evangelists, but I've collected these stories over the years of people who are willing to put their faith into action regarding the Sabbath, meeting impossible odds to keep the Sabbath. I have a story of a young girl being told to, to test in a communist regime, and she says no because it's a Sabbath, and you know all these consequences are going to happen, and then she stands up anyway and secretly her teacher defies the communist regime and lets her you know lets her not do it on the sabbath gives her makeup things like that you know i've heard stories of farmers who say the weather is not going to respond to me not working and then the weather actually responds to them not working you know i have stories upon stories upon stories upon stories of this creation power showing up to enable god's people to keep the seventh day holy amen this is what I want us to leave with here today. We have power at our disposal. Why don't we experience that power more often? I guess that can be rhetorical, but I didn't necessarily mean it to be. Why do you think? Why don't we experience that power more often? If you happen to be listening to the Sabbath school lesson this morning, the answer is the same as why the old covenant failed. We don't experience this power more often because most of us make our Christian experience all about us. And as I already said, neither, my, neither I nor you have the power in and of ourselves to create a world just because we say so. So if my Christian experience is all about me, then I've got all of my own power at my disposal. But if my Christian experience is all about Jesus, the creator, then I've got all of creation power at my disposal. Amen. Thank you for that. So here's my appeal. I could appeal to you to keep a better Sabbath. And probably that's a secondary or tertiary lesson that I hope we get, right? We all could probably keep a better Sabbath. You know, we're going to quit doing something we shouldn't be doing or quit watching something we shouldn't be watching or quit whatever, right? We're going to quit. We're going to rest. But that's not actually my appeal today. My appeal <laughs> is to experience creation power, okay? Well, which is not about you. There's nothing you can do to make that happen. You just need to be connected to Jesus to make that happen. Jesus wants to be connected to you. Jesus wants you to live in the fullest sense of what it means to be a Christian. With all of that power, the Bible promises to us, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It's going to raise my heart from the dead. 
It's going to transform my mind. So maybe I'm not making it all about me anymore. Maybe I recognize that my experience is all about Christ, which makes it all about you. Right? If we're all servants, <laughs> I can't serve you unless I'm, you know, sharing my experience with you. It's all about each other. To make it all about me makes it all about the devil, right? That was his problem. I, I, I will be like the most high. Making it all about you. All about Jesus. All about not me. That's really the key here. I think a couple weeks ago we had a message from the pulpit, why do you go to church? I think that was a couple weeks ago. That was a good message, right? Why do you go to church? It's not about you. <laughs> That's what I got from that message. It's not about you. You're not here for yourself. You're here for the Lord and you're here for each other. And this is just an extension of that. If that becomes our mentality, instead of making it what I want, getting what I want out of it, but instead I make it what you want and how I can serve you and minister to you and bring you up to God. If I am lessened and he is increased, there's power in that. So that's my appeal to you. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing by the grace of God to just get out of his way? Give him a day. Don't make it about you. Don't make it about me. Make it about Jesus. In every thought, in every action, in every whatever we do, make it about Jesus and watch as he responds. Watch as he pours out that creation power into our lives. Amen? Are we willing to at least try? Taste and see that the Lord is good? You can't, I hope you won't just take my word for it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray.